app. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 62. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Hello. And Orion. What's up? And we are going to be talking about PAX Unplugged 2019. I think my favorite PAX Unplugged yet. I don't know. Really? If it, it was a blur. It was, it I was going to say, this is the first time the three of us have been on a podcast in some months. Whoa. Sorry, I just played an audio clip. We're going to have to figure out how to turn that off. Okay, I'm back. Wait, did you just start playing another episode <laughs> of the podcast? No, no. I I had my voice memo app up. Because oh, okay. It packs like once or twice a day. I'll just record some thoughts on what had happened in the last couple hours. So that's what went off. <laughs> okay. But yeah, this is, this is the first time we have been back together on the podcast in a while. Orion wasn't part of the trade one, right? No, I haven't been on a couple. Yeah. Uh, he's also cause... done some interviews, I think. Yeah. Some interviews. And then Orion's just been all around the world, which which makes it harder. Not impossible. But harder, mm-hmm. yeah. World traveler. Anyways, I had a blast at PAX Unplugged. I thought it was awesome. It was my favorite, I think, as a member of the media. As someone, like, trying to do things work-wise, it, w- it was super successful for me. Although I didn't, I think yeah. in previous PAXs we played more fun games. Yeah, I I would I would agree with that, except for the part where I'm not a part of the media. Really, <laughs> it was different. I I don't know that I'd say it's my favorite, but it, it was a it was a really good one, and it felt different than the last time I went, which was good for other reasons. Yeah. So what what were your overall impressions of this particular PAX? It was such a weird week for me because I had just driven across the country and I was like sleep deprived and, you know, time zones and everything. But uh, once I got to PAX itself on Saturday, I had a pretty good time. I didn't go in really planning much of anything, just kind of figured I'd wander around and play some games, uh, which I did. So Uh, I think I wanted to hit first look and maybe unpub. But Mm -hmm. beyond that, I didn't have a list of games that I was trying to play or booths to see or you know any media stuff or any, any specific people i was even looking for uh other than the the eight of us that were sharing a house or whatever yeah i i, I had fewer things planned going in um as well uh i just wanted to play a bunch of games uh which which i think i ended up playing fewer games maybe than i have in previous packs, but um just worked out that way yeah, just impressions of, of of the convention overall. Like it's 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 just a great con, and it's it's growing. Like the floor space was bigger this year, but you know, completely filled with activity, all kinds of different activity, but not too much activity. Like sometimes you feel Paxi skits. Um, so it was exciting. Just there were big events. Frost Haven was kind of like this big announcement and um so yeah i mean it, it it was a great con i think all in all so yeah i'm wondering since again next year it's going to be in conflict with bgg con and orion went to bgg con this year how do they compare in terms of conventions oh they feel entirely different bgg con is much smaller for one i think there's a few thousand instead of what's paxis like ten thousand or a pax unplugged like ten 10 or, not 10 or 15 sure. I, I saw a number of 30,000 but that's probably total 30? entrances I don't know about per day okay um, I don't think there were 30,000 people there at a time yeah anyway well easily 10,000 people uh, unique people at BGG I think it was maybe a third of that probably probably less and it was in a hotel so instead of a conference uh, convention center so that feels totally different uh, BGG Con was also spread out all over the place. So there was a library down in the basement and an, a small expo hall, exhibit hall. Then there was a, a couple main rooms of games, some other breakout rooms, and then upstairs a bunch of smaller conference room size set up uh, with other games. So it was kind of spread out all over the places. It was kind of hard to find people that you were looking for sometimes. 
and there weren't as many events going on. Uh, PAX Unplugged has so many more tournaments and exhibits and just activities happening everywhere. And uh, BGG was really just people were there to play games, and that was about it. Yeah, what I've heard from other people is that BGG is is just about playing games, and then PAX is, I I think, relatively the emphasis is on the expo hall at PAX. Although... It's interesting, because for me, PAX East has gotten more and more about playing games. PAX Unplugged has gotten less and less about playing games. And more about the expo hall, yeah. Well, the yeah. Expo Hall at PAX East is just so overwhelming. Like, I spend an hour or two there, and then I'm like, I, I got to get out of this place and go to somewhere quieter. Whereas PAX Unplugged, it, the Expo Hall, I didn't find as overwhelming at all. They also, they spread out the Expo Hall more. Like, all the aisles were bigger, and all the booths were corner booths, I think. There weren't the kind of the tight, long aisles with tables jammed up against each other. So there's a lot more <laughs> space in that whole you know, half of a big room. Uh, so that helped a lot. Yeah, I think that the organization of the Expo Hall was really, really nicely done this year. The organization of the free play tables and how they numbered and categorized them, however, was horrific. Oh my goodness. Had no, it didn't seem to have much of an organization at all. I, I didn't understand how they numbered and labeled everything. Yeah, I had two organizational gripes with the, the conference, and one of them is that. It's just like, why would you not have one grid-style numbering system? You know, letters one way, numbers the other way for the entire room. Just do that. Just put numbers yeah. th- down the length and then, you know, letters from one side to the, to the other. Mean, it was. I think that's what they tried to do. Um, but then the, the lettering went like A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. And oh, did it? And, the, num- yeah. the numbers jumped all over the place. You'd have like one through seven, and then it would jump to like twenty three through twenty four, and then it would jump back to the teens. It was it was all maybe, over the place. Maybe there's some reason like they they had to change it at the last minute or something. But I, I hope they do a better job of that. I think that's that's an area that they could just improve the cons so much just by getting that better. Um, yeah. Cause I had two situations where I could not find somebody cause they were giving me letters and numbers on a table they're at. And I had no idea where to go. It doesn't help also that there are pillars in the conference center that have a different organizational structure printed on them. And so most of the time I thought they were referring to these pillars and uh, it was not that. The other organizational issue was um, some of the signups for special events were, I think they, they had problems with those in the early years of, of PAX Unplugged. And as the conference has gotten bigger, the solutions that they came up with haven't really improved uh, the situation for larger amounts of people. So I was disappointed. I, I thought I was in a um, Vampire the Masquerade World of, World of Darkness RPG session, and then uh, it turns out I showed up and I was on the wait list, not on the actual list. So you know that that was my worst feels bad moment of the conference. Other than that, I, I think it, it it was a marvelous con, uh, great things planned everywhere. Um, but there were some organizational things. Yeah, and I think this is the first PAX I've ever been to where I didn't go to a single panel, which which was weird looking back it's like wow i didn't i usually go to one couple at least but nothing really stood out to me and i knew i could just find the streams later and for the main they they see they seem de-emphasized or at least their the emphasis on on those uh panels i don't think has scaled with the size of the the con overall i think that's intentional because i was part of a group that actually submitted a panel idea and the response we got back was, we love the panel idea, but there's just no room for extraneous panels at this con. Like, yeah, they're all yeah. filled by the big, big, big names. And they actually recommended we resubmit it at PAX East, which I think we did. I wasn't the, in charge of resubmitting, but they actually recommended on this kind of niche yeah. board game topic to submit it at PAX East because there's more availability there. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's fine. Like Like, like we've all said... We didn't go planning on on going to tax, and that's what we wanted. Uh, So let's talk about what we saw in the Expo Hall. I thought, again, it was was very well organized. I I noticed that 
I think the quality of the booths in terms of like more people had large banners and kind of clarity to what they were. And I think just physically they were organized better. Everything well just staffed looked too. well staffed. Everything looked more professional, I felt, than in previous years. Uh, so were there any games in particular that you guys saw while wandering the expo hall that you wanted to point out? What was um, the World War one we looked at, Matt? Yeah, that's that was one the one the... that jumped out at me. I spent very little time in the expo hall. That, that, that really one. super big one? Yeah, yeah. War, Room War Room is the yeah. name of that. And so this is a – it to me, it looks like the designer of Axis and Allies saying, let's remake Axis and Allies for the modern board gaming world. Yes. Um, it, and – I didn't play it. I, I think uh, I think the full game takes twelve hours to play, <laughs> um, but it looks like it might be a successful implementation of that kind of game for the modern board, board gaming uh, world. Like the map is just gorgeous. Um, when we showed up to the booth, it's this really neat world map that is. Uh, it's like a round. Like you're looking down from the North Pole. But it, it kind of it's off centered in a way that emphasizes, you know, like the European and Pacific theaters. Uh, but it's just this massive world with all these units that are color coded really cleanly. And and then uh, how did the actual um, gameplay go, Orion? Do, do you remember? Well, the the big selling point is that they've got the whole mat, and you've got those little uh, sticks to push armies around on a giant war room map. You know, hence the <laughs> name. I mean, that was, was, that was really the visual that sold the whole thing. <laughs> oh, and the experience of, like, you think, oh, that, that's kind of dumb. It's just stacks of plastic. And then you pick up this, this stick and you're moving them around. You're like, I feel like a general. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very much in that aesthetic. It was a diplomacy style uh, simultaneous movement thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So everyone yeah. got but, so, envelopes. But with, yeah. But with a really, it looks like a, a kind of a nuanced battle system um, where units can kind of be offensively or defensively poised and there are these colored dice that you roll that that correspond to different units so it, it looks pretty complex yeah um, it looked like a just, an evolution of axis and allies really and uh and that's a good thing because i like well, it that's literally allies. what it is the the, the guy who yeah designed well axis yeah and Ally, it's the same designer yeah yeah he was standing right there, but talking to someone else, I didn't get to say hi. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, got, we got an explanation from him. I didn't realize it was him at the time, but yeah. Oh, really? He seemed excited okay. about it. So, yeah, I mean, if you want a big, massive, kind of serious and theming war game, this could be really cool. I I almost get the, the feeling like this is like what Twilight Imperium would be if themed in like a serious historical sense. I mean, it's really about the it's aesthetic just, of it. It's about yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms the of just the stick, it. it's about having an entirely separate table for battle resolutions and all the armies and such. Like it has to be on a different table. It's so massive. The deluxe version comes with like a beautiful neoprene version of the map, mm -hmm. and um, you can get a really, really, really big map. Yeah, um, it, it's that it's that kind of like Ti epic experience feel. Mm -hmm. Is basically the vibe that that I got. Yeah, uh, and they were selling it for two hundred and fifty bucks, I think. I think that that is the deluxe version, but I could be wrong. That might be the base. Oh, version. was there a cheaper version? Yeah, I think does... it was like one sixty for the regular and two forty for the mega deluxe one, okay. or something like something like that. So that's actually yeah. that's not as bad as I thought. Because I thought I'm like, oh man, two hundred fifty bucks is that's a that's a lot of money for a game. Uh, it, although it's, it's you a see big, where nice the money went. Game. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it comes with a lot of different components that look like they all fit together nicely. So anyway, I don't know if I'll get to play this, but it was impressive to say the least. Mm -hmm. It might have been the most impressive thing in the expo hall. That was that was definitely a standout in terms of visuals. Frosthaven, of course, it was the big news coming out of PAX Unplugged. I saw it there. They had it set up and people playing it with the six starting characters on a custom built like miniature setup, which looked pretty cool. But I mean, yeah, it, it as far as I can tell, it's just another Gloomhaven. Not that that's a bad <laughs> yeah. thing. I mean, we all yeah. want more Gloomhaven, but I can't help but feel a little bit disappointed that there's not more. Yeah, I, I was hoping for some some iteration 
Um, I mean, Gloomhaven is so brilliant, but like we got together last week and played Gloomhaven for the first time in months, and it was every bit as good as it has been. Are we are we really going to need to buy Gloomhaven again to continue to get that experience? Maybe I don't know. I mean, honestly, I I got to look, but I think we're almost done with Gloomhaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've yeah, counted, I, I mean, I've recorded forty sessions of Gloomhaven that I've played. And there are wow, a handful okay. that I wasn't part of. But of course, we have the expansion that we haven't even opened yet, the Forgotten Circles expansion. Uh, the big change from what I can tell with Frosthaven, I did watch the panel they did online that was just a Q&A with Tom Vassell, and it's just another Gloomhaven, but there's this like town building mechanism, I believe, where you actually okay. can construct the town and, and you get more options and opportunities uh, as that grows, and you can change how it grows neat. in different ways, which could be cool. But he was really de-emphasizing the, un- the like the appeal of that, and really emphasizing that the appeal was more characters, more enemies, more scenarios. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, which, which makes me a bit suspicious of this new thing. I mean, all the kind of like road events and and coming back to Gloomhaven town to do do things that's all neat but it has kind of lost its charm over time for me i mean it's a fantastic legacy system it absolutely is that to say i think like a little more interactive mini game in in the town that you go back to it it sounds great but also like maybe that gets old 15 games in (laughs) yeah so not as exciting as a a gloomhaven 2 announcement could be but it's still gloomhaven so it's it's still Gloomhaven. And and he said that it went over a few of the different characters and it's gonna be a bit more compli they're gonna be a bit more complicated. I know there are rules for crossing over in terms of items crossing over or even using Gloomhaven or Frosthaven characters in yeah. the other campaign, which is cool. Uh, I know there was one character that's gonna have two hands of cards. It's like a split personality kind of thing. Oh, that's funny. Um, <laughs> and you might be able to swap between your two decks mid scenario which sounded rad uh so fun stuff like that yeah but in terms of like visually like it looks exactly the same like i had to really it, lean it, over it's one of those things look where at the table to even tell like is this a just them playing gloomhaven or are are they playing frosthaven it's like half-life right when we played half-life 2 way back when like it was the most amazing thing ever, and like I, I played it over and over again. You know, got so many hours of enjoyment from it. But they waited until they had something radical to do to release the next big Half Life. <laughs> I kind of wish they'd done that with Gloomhaven, you know. But yeah. hey, anything else you guys saw well, in the Expo Hall that stood out? I wanted to mention Over Battle real quick. Over Battle, the All War. Oh yeah, I, uh, I didn't stop by there. Yeah, I talked it, about them before. It looks like a big, what, 4X-ish game. But what was really cool to me was the map that you play on. First of all, like all good grids, it's hexagonal-based. But I've never seen a game divide hexagons into three diamonds before. It makes so much sense. It makes for some really interesting um, (laughs) movement decisions. Uh, that are less straightforward than hexes or triangles, certainly squares. So anyway, I was just, uh, I think I, I went up with Ben and we were just blown away by these diamonds fitting together on um, on this beautiful map. And then the other movement thing that's really interesting is that um, when you put planets down, they have an orbit around them and they kind of, the planets are hexes that sit sit on, you know, over top of this diamond grid, but the orbits have a really interesting movement thing where if you, if you jump into an orbit, you can go all the way around it. And in doing so, you you might be able to to move three times as far as you would, if you were just in open space. Oh, so you can Um, like slingshot. Like slingshot. Yeah. And, and um, I think the, the planets are all placed kind of in a draft like format at the beginning of the game so you can have really interesting variations on the topology of the the world that you're playing on so i thought that was really cool other than that i i wasn't blown away it kind of looked like a pretty bare bones 4x experience but um uh it looks nice the the neoprene mat again was absolutely gorgeous 
And uh, just for the the cool movement alone, I was kind of intrigued. Yeah, I've I've seen them around at a couple of PAXs now, and uh, they always got their little table. I don't. I'm looking up now if they've actually run a Kickstarter or anything. But I think they're really ramping up for a big Kickstarter. The idea, again, like the other one we were talking about, the, I think the idea is just for it to be a kind of a showy game. I don't know how to do it, how to say that. Like, it's designed specifically to be an all-day takeover a room yeah, style yeah, game. Yeah, yeah it, it, and I should say, there might be really interesting things in the combat. There's like this 3D system, I think, that they've they built into it. It didn't immediately capture my imagination, but it very well could be great as well. Yeah. Yet to see. It looks like it was on Kickstarter, but maybe didn't succeed. Yeah, I think they might be rebooting it in the coming months. Yeah, it did It did not. It got canceled, and I assume they're going to reboot it since they're at conventions. Uh, so yeah. good luck to them. I mean, those kinds of games... I, I'd, I'd much rather see a game like that that really commits than a game that tries to capture the epic experience in a small playtime and then fails at both types of games. I, I haven't yet got a chance to play it, but it looks like it could be interesting. A similar style game, but again, like if you're interested in those those big, long, epic 4X or, or uh, war type games, both War Room and this Over Battle are worth checking out. Yeah. Sniper Elite was the game that I heard about on Friday night and like people were raving about it. They're like, this is the game of the con. It's incredible. So I finally got to check it out on Sunday and I only got, I I was like squeezing it between meetings. So I got about a 10 minute play of it and it does look very cool. It's it's like a stealth it's a hidden movement game, but it very much plays out like a stealth video game, or at least in the looks of it. And I talked with the designers, and their main point was that they love hidden movement games, but they all take so long. And so they wanted to make one that that's like 45 minutes long. So if... Okay. Right, because the problem is, if you're doing a hidden movement game, you end up playing super conservatively because, you know, if you make a mistake, you're just stuck there for like an hour and a half resolving your mistake and if you have a shorter game the players are going to be more willing to take more risks and do daring things uh Mm -hmm. so it's based off of the video game series which i haven't played the the publisher of the video game is actually publishing this and it's like their first project in a board game spin-off company and it's a pretty simple system where one person's controlling a single sniper your opponent is controlling different groups of units that get activated and you go back and forth activating them as the sniper if you move quickly and you walk in a space adjacent to an enemy you have to tell them that they were alerted the enemies have different powers in terms of narrowing down where your location by region or looking in very specific areas Uh, The sniper has different tools like throwing a rock or setting a landmine or actually shooting. The shooting mechanism was really cool because it's a bag builder thing. And, And as you shoot successfully or unsuccessfully, you get more or less flustered, basically. And that will add or take away things from your bag that will determine the success of your shots. And so it's a kind of a push your luck thing where the longer and more difficult your shot is, so maybe it's going through a window or something, uh, the more chits you pool trying to avoid a certain number of failures and trying to get a certain number of successes. Or I think you have to keep pulling until you get a number of successes equal to the distance. And if you get like two failures, you fail. Um, But there are things that will modify that in terms of getting spooked or getting seen or your heart rate that will make shots more or less difficult. I think it has a lot of potential and the designers are really cool to talk to. And it says on BGG a 2021 release, so they might be really slow rolling this out, but the version I played seemed pretty much done and I'm excited to, to see where that goes. Did it feel as snappy as they, you know, intended it to be? Yeah, I mean, in 10 minutes, I got a rules explanation and played like three rounds. Cool. And I pretty, I felt like I knew 95% of the rules. So it was, it was quite snappy, but I was still making interesting decisions and there were lots of different things I could do. Yeah, it felt really, really nice. 
The other standout from my random Expo Hall wanderings was Clask, which is a dexterity game that's like air hockey, but with balls and magnets instead of tiny spurts of air coming out of the tail table and a disc. And I wrote about this yesterday, and it was shockingly good. Have either of you played this? No, I I think did he tweet a picture of it? Oh no, maybe I read your article and saw the picture. I'd never seen this before. Yeah, so you there's a little pawn that is like your stick that you're using to hit the ball, but you control it with a magnet underneath the table, and you're just trying to score the ball into your opponent's goal, which is a little hole, like indentation in the table. But you end up basically own goaling more than anything because you can't let your pawn get detached from the magnet or you your opponent scores. You can't pull it into your own hole, which I did a lot because it's right there, or else your opponent scores. And then there are these little beads that you'll pick up if you extend too far into the middle of the table. And if you pick up two of the three of those, you lose. Or you, your opponent scores a goal. So it's so much about trying to avoid all of these traps while simultaneously playing something that feels kind of like air hockey. And it worked really, really so well. It's, so it's, it's not turn-based? like you're. No, it's just you're hitting a ball around yeah, with a stick. Yeah. It, it, it looks like air hockey. A little yeah, bit. It's just a so, ball instead of a disc. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. But the tables, you know, it's, I don't know how long it is, but it's, it's you know, board game size. It's smallish. It's not how a large stable table. How, oh, I see. It, it, it comes with like a Oh, how a big stable? Stand. Yeah. Yeah. It, it felt pretty, really yeah. stable. And like I wrote in the article, the, sh- the magnet is shockingly strong. So I always thought that I'd seen it and I thought it, it would feel flimsy, but it, you feel really connected. And if you fling that thing off there, you got to really fling it. So I think I, I was able to disconnect it once and it was like a really rapid re- defensive response. You hit the ball on the other side of the table, but it felt like my fault for moving too quickly, which I think was key to that game. And then the beads, the magnetic beads in the middle are so light that you get near them and you start to see them move and you're like, ah, and you have to pull back. They're really easy to pick up. But I also found that if you pick up one of them, it'll just kind of poke out the side and then you can like bat the ball with it. So I don't know, new layers of strategy emerge as I play this silly little hit a ball with a stick game. And I, I was very surprised how much I enjoyed it. It looks like it'd be right at home in a, in a family room with like foosball, maybe yeah. that, that doesn't have as much space. <laughs> And I think they might sell larger versions because they did have a TV playing with like the Clask World Championships, and that looked like a larger table. But I mean, the the regular small size worked just fine. The final game I wanted to highlight from the Expo Hall is Foodies, uh, a small box or you know regular size box game from Simon, which was incredibly disappointing. I I'm still can't believe how unfun this game was. Because it looked really cool, and it's about, like, foodies going around and trying to find cool restaurants. But, man, it was boring. (laughs) Oh, no. It was... It's like the Catan resource thing, except you're, instead of, you know, buying houses on the Catan board, you're paying for cards to put on a grid in front of you from a display... And the cards will go over, you know, it's a, not, it's a one through nine grid and you, those will make your rolls better. So, you know, instead of getting one coin, if you roll a two, you'll get two coins. The problem is that there are like five types of card and then that's it. And you're just rotating through those five types of cards with very small and inconsequential variations. And yeah. then you just accumulate coins and points and then it's over. It was so underwhelming, and I did not understand the appeal at all. Although I must say, yeah. everyone else I was demoing the game with enjoyed it, and I think one of them bought a copy. So maybe I'm just a grouch. <laughs> is there? So I'm trying to get something just from a picture of of the game. Is there a spatial element to your board? A little bit. There's like these these like half stars, and if you connect them you get like an extra point. It's barely anything. And it, yeah, but that's, 
Yeah, that sounds. It's like if you took all of these concepts of like putting things into a grid and buying cards from a display and the Catan resource thing, and then you tried to make it as dull as possible. <laughs> That's basically what the game was with really fun art. The art, I will admit, was fun, and that's why I sat down to demo and like, oh, this looks interesting. And I, I, I like the the theme of it, but man, I, that was I'm, I'm bored just talking about it. Um, <laughs> let's let's move on then. Let's move on then. Can we start maybe the um? Uh, this is a couple games ago, but I've had on my mind this Sniper Elite reminds me that Orion and I played a hidden movement game in the first look section, which was just awesome as it always is. Shout out to all the the volunteers at the first look Mm -hmm. uh, area. They do great work. It's amazing. Uh, Yeah. That was my favorite area. Probably. uh, I got to bring this up. What was that game called Ryan? That Uh, sabotage, I think sabotage. Yeah. So it's, it's Oh, is that the new restoration games? Mm, I don't don't think so. I think it's brand new. So it's a 2v2 hidden movement, um, and it's delightfully themed. You kind of have the evil geniuses, and then you have the spies that are infiltrating the evil geniuses' base. Oh, this is yeah. the Tim Fowers game. Okay. Yep. Nice. Now, this was a cool game. You've got, basically, you both have the same 4x4 four four grid that you're moving around, and there's these devices in the base, you know, the death rays and generators and walls that kind of create your environment. And those are mirrored for both people. But then you move your little, you know, your person around the grid. And that part is is hidden. And then you have a hand of actions you can do. And one player will roll dice and everyone gets the same dice pool. And then the different actions in your hand can only be used or can basically require a certain die number to use that action. So the move action for the spies takes like a one through four lets you move. And then the, I think a five or six lets you hack, which is those are your basic two actions, um, moving around and hacking one of the devices. And then as you go, every successful hack, you kind of get an experience point towards additional actions. For the spies, I think it's called swagger. And... <laughs> When you have more swagger, you get to do more things. Basically, you get to keep, you get to use more of the dice. And the other thing is, for the spies, at least every time you successfully scan, because there's a a scanning mechanic that you say uh, row B or you know column C or you know orange sector or whatever, and the other per- team has to tell you kind of what's there or how many people are there, depending on which team, and Every time you get you hit on one of those, you get a I don't know you get a different t- sort of experience which unlocks additional gear. So then you have more actions you can use. So it'll be, uh, and then each there are four classes you can play. You'll pick two of them as the spies, and there's one person that has a bunch of gadgets, and there's one that does a bunch of acrobatics, and so they have different kind of sets of moves that you can add to your base base plan. Uh, what about yeah. the the villain side, Matt? You you were on that side. Yeah, um, it's very similar. Um, uh, it's similar, but kind of flavored differently. We could spend actions because we occasionally f- found that maybe we only needed to do one action or like one or three actions would be good, but two didn't really matter. So we can spend those extra actions to kind of unlock more die um, dice. That's how we did it, w- which is kind of an interesting trade off. The decisions of what we were going to do on our turns weren't super hard but were interesting enough of a puzzle especially when considering that we had to have the right numbers on the dice to, to do the things we wanted it to do we sp- so the super villains spend a lot of time scanning uh, for the spies trying to shoot them with laser guns and also powering up these devices that we have that give us more uh, I forget what resource they gave us. But if we could get these these devices online, it would give us an advantage. And then the spies could could go in and sabotage those. I think what I what I found really fun about the game is it's a hidden movement game, but I was never as in the dark as as I am in say Dracula. You're almost always a turn or two away of from having really good information, but it's still really it's really fun. So 
we probably went through what four or five cycles of like knowing where the spies were acting on that knowledge and then being in the dark again. So I like that. I don't think I've played a game that, that has kind of that short term, interesting hidden feeling. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. There's kind of a so- short cycle. Cause every time you stun one of the spies, they parachute in again and can pick anywhere on the grid to start. Yeah. And, and, and you know that you're going to find them in, you know, two to four turns. Uh, so it's really about, I think for the spies, it had to be about just like making the most of the the little bit of time you have, uh, or maybe pulling off one clever thing. Yeah, and getting, I also, it, getting an edge that way. <laughs> I think the other thing that we didn't use is that one of your tiles lets you move the other person, and normally uh-huh. when you move, you have to scan and move, which means you declare your row or column or sector, and then the villains have to tell you what's there. But it also tells the villains where you are. But if you use the, the what is it, the com link or something, you can move the other person without declaring uh, where they are. You just say move or scan or, you know, whatever. And then also one of, is it the first unlock? I think the first unlock for all the spies is a, like a decoy or something. And it basically lets you scan anywhere. And it kind of lets you pretend like you're somewhere else. So... After you do something, you'll, you're able to start trying to throw mis- more misinformation in. And I don't know if that ever worked at all. You guys seem to pretty much know where we were. But there are, there are some options there. There's some play, I think. That sounds really it's, cool. It's wonderfully whimsical. So interesting that, that we played you know, two hidden movement games that, that excite us. I think it's been a while since I felt like bringing out Fury of Dracula again. Yeah, this Hidden is, Movement, yeah. it's always, at least the games we played, so Fury of Dracula and Hunt for the Ring, it's always felt more like there was more potential than there was game, and I'm, maybe these will be the ones. I think both of these we've talked about are intentionally shorter. Yeah, which, that, which I think that, is a like, good idea. Well, you randomly found me on the first turn, so now the three-hour game is over, or, you know, or something, so. Yeah. Um, the other cool little bit about Sabotage is that it uses the the box kind of unfolds into the screen between the, the players. Oh, nice. And it's got all this cool art and dials on it and stuff to, you know, to pretend you're like you're in the base or you're infiltrating. Yeah, Fowers, a- a plus box usage. Fowers' games are always really cool looking. I, I love his art style and I, I need to play more of them. Like, I really want to play Burgle Brothers, but there's a there's a sequel coming out, I think. I played hardback and very much enjoyed it. Um, I haven't yet pay- played paperback, but his games are kind of... Oh, I always miss them a bit, so I'm glad you guys were able to play that. In terms of games I played in the first look section, uh, Matt and I played Namiji. I think that's the title of the game, uh, which was essentially Tokaido 2. Um, yeah. Although I didn't like it. I don't think I liked it as much. It seemed softer, which was odd. Yeah, I think I liked it more, but I didn't particularly like Takedo. Whereas I like Takedo more than I can express. Like I, I like Takedo to a degree that I, 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 and I can't quite explain why. I just really like it. I think you might have said it well in your your article. It, it's kind of like if you if you love the aesthetic, you get a lot more of it. You probably need. You probably want one or the other. Maybe if you want something a, a tad gentler, go with Namiji. I mean, I, I, I think it's for someone, but I'm not sure it's for people who already own Takedo. Yeah, I think it's for people who... It's either people who don't own Takedo or people for whom Takedo is their favorite game. Yeah. <laughs> I have no intention... I, I have no desire to own Namiji. Like, I played it, I'm like, okay, cool. It's Takedo it, but with some things changed. It really was beautiful and pleasant and... It was really fun to pull shrimp out of a bag um, exceptionally well. I, I have great skill when it comes to pulling uh, shrimp from a bag. I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that one was it was interesting. I, I, I wouldn't have expected that from a sequel to a game. First of all, being so much like the game, but also making it easier to learn and softer to play. Detective Club was... Is this a, the one you hated? A game... The- 
Mysterium Spyfall game that you said was terrible? Yeah, I looked it up. It's actually the same designer as Mysterium. So I guess yeah, he this, wanted to take this his game one was, and make it bad. Th- this was a big question mark. I, I don't know what was... It was like it was underdeveloped. <laughs> like, they were very... Like, yeah. we started house ruling the game to, like, give people a decision. We're like, really? Turn order starts there? If it started in a different spot, that I mean, person would have a decision instead of, of not having like one. We should have just played it as it was written to be played all the way through to give it a chance. But because the, when the we... The house were so we did, did it. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like... It didn't fix it. It still wasn't good. I mean, so it has the Mysterium thing of surreal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You said it perfectly, Mark. It, again, in the article. So, so some of these you've co- already covered in your your yes. r- your written work. But what is it like? Spyfall and Mysterium, but the least interesting parts of both. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Well, the problem is that it just didn't work because we always yeah. found the spy because yeah. it was very obvious. And we couldn't get around that. <laughs> yeah, the, the spy th- fall thing being everyone is putting down these surreal cards in turn to convey um, a, a secret word that, that's been determined. But one of the people doesn't know the word. And every and, time there was just one that just betrayed them. Yeah, and it feels like at best, maybe you, you know, if you're really good at the game you know sometimes you you can blend in but probably mostly by happenstance it, i don't get it Mysterium well you also have is, the turn order it, problem right the idea is that you're supposed to be able to see the other cards that are played and yeah, then kind of yeah. follow along well that doesn't work if you're the first one to play <laughs> yeah which which, which we happened did twice in a row for us and it's yeah, like it, well, this it, is a serious problem yeah, it's like this just feels bad. I can't can't do anything here. But it just like Mysterium is so good. If you if you want to be conveying information through beautiful surreal art, just play Mysterium. Yeah, I, I don't understand. I do understand, however, the recommendations I've I've seen time and time again for For Sale because For Sale was amazing and super fun. Yeah, so this was this was a great little game. Yeah, now I know why everyone on Earth recommends it. I will be adding to that count and actually it's similar to i've been playing here on vacation i've been playing modern art and uh, modern art just feels like for sale but more stuff going on like they're just kind of two very very pleasant super enjoyable auction games it's interesting to hear what kind of games people describe as pleasant because i don't think it's possible for an auction game to be pleasant (laughs) but (laughs) it was certainly fun but i you don't, These you don't games... find brain agony pleasant? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Oh, well, I do. So there we go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'd call an auction game pleasant. I really liked modern art, but I don't think I'd call it pleasant. Well, okay. Oh, well, I'm an odd one. Okay, here's one that was definitely pleasant, and maybe my favorite game I played at PAX Unplugged, Goat and Goat. Goat and Goat? I'm just going to say, this was the game of the con, I think, for all of us, honestly. It (laughs) It was great. (laughs) It was probably the easiest or simplest game that we played all weekend, and we also all loved it, and it was probably the best. It was super fun. We we played it towards the end of the day when, like, my brain kind of hurt, and then we just sit down in this, like, pleasant, simple game that actually made me start thinking again and had interesting decisions like i didn't i did not expect the depth of play when we sat down to this yeah so you have this hand of goats and it's just it's three suits it's a card game with three suits in numbers one through five yep. and the idea is that you play all any or, or all of your cards in hand that are the same number and you're trying to get piles of similar suits but once you play a number in a suit you can't play a lower number you have to keep going higher or the same number but the thing is so say you have like five ones in hand and you play them all out now you can only draw one card but you want to play low numbers because that's how you get more you 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 give yourself more freedom to play cards further in the pile but the more you play low numbers the fewer cards you draw you're building up (laughs) colored stacks of goats but you always have Uh, yes herds of goats in your pens 
Uh, but you always have to play equal or higher number goats um, for any color that you already have in your pen. And then you score, you climb up the mountains and score. And if you have a size seven pen, you can score anything up to the seven mountain. Yeah. Um, and I think the mountains go up to nine in a three player nine. game. Yeah. Yep. I think uh, I think the scoring cards go three to nine, but you remove some for smaller player counts. Yeah, it, it shifted a bit based on player count. But just the, just the tension between keeping yourself open for flexibility versus the the cards you the number of cards you're able to draw versus the push your luck of trying to get the higher scoring mountains was was just wonderful. I thought the scoring was really interesting in that like maybe you you just happen to be holding multiple threes of the same color. Well, you know that's coming, so you're not going to score that color. But if I played like three twos that are three green twos and I don't have any higher green cards, maybe I just score the, you know, the, the lowest green score card right away. I, you know, my pen, my green pen empties, but I, that was an interesting dynamic too. Um, and Mark, I think you won by basically going for the biggest score cards <laughs> right away. Uh, whereas I was gobbling up smaller cards and, and we were close, but yeah, your, yours was, was the were larger cards. If you ever do play a lower card or any, is it cards you have left in your hand at yes. the end? Those are penalty goats, and they go to the penalty box. The penalty box. And so we had a great time imagining goats playing hockey and then all getting piled into a giant penalty box uh, throughout the course of the game. Yes. Dozens of goats in the penalty box. Yeah. yeah. I have no goat idea. Goat and goat. I have goat no idea goat. if this game is available in the United States. It's a Japanese game, I believe. But if it is, uh, go buy a copy. It's super fun. Another game we played in first look was Crystal Palace, which we stopped playing three-fifths of the way through the game. I think there might be something interesting here, but at that point in time, it's like, well, we've seen the game, and it seems very bloated. Yeah. Yeah, this is a more fiddly worker placement than (laughs) I, I really want. There were some really cool things in this game. I really liked how you bought your worker, your worker dice. Yeah. And I liked the drafting position, your worker placement part where you draft your placements and how the higher numbers get you on the black market or do the, you know, the, the follow action Mm -hmm. and the, how you were trying to pair up inventors and inventions or whatever they were, people and inventions Mm -hmm. uh, that went together Um, so that was all cool, but like we said, there were about four locations that were interesting, and then there were four more locations that were just place a die, get a resource. And it felt like the game just kind of sprawled and needed to be bounded and developed or tightened up. There were flashes of like, wow, this might be interesting. I think like once I pulled off a turn where I, I, you know, I managed to do three synergistic logistic things that that worked but too much of the time i was just kind of waiting to see which of the many resource spaces was going to be easy for me to get yeah so the idea that your workers are dice and that you pay for the number of pips that you put up which gives you access to potentially going first in a space or even unlocking certain spaces is cool but again yeah all the resource spaces felt redundant and dull i didn't quite get the black market thing was okay there were some cool ideas in there like thematic stuff that just didn't work out like the idea that you're collecting fame and you get these newspapers and then what do you do with newspapers well you just turn them in for resources which doesn't really make sense it really wanted to be a game about the cost benefit analysis of your dice and trying to outposition people in a worker placement situation, but there was just too much other stuff. It, I, it, it just needed to be more focused. It needed to be more focused. Another thing that needed more focus is the theming was frustrating. So the the World's Fair is a, a super interesting thing to, to theme around, but it rather than being uh, whimsical or feeling inventory, it was just bogged down in so many drab looking things on the table. 
Yeah, the color scheme was very brown. It, and it was just like, there are 13 brown rectangles of cardboard on the table. Yes. <laughs> you know, this this one invention card I got and this one inventor that kind of goes with it, they look really cool, but they're just lost in the sea of drab cardboard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder know. if at that any point I wonder if at any point the game was on a single board rather than like you said 13 separate smaller boards. And I wonder if that yeah. would work better or look better. I guess it'd be difficult because the boards do have to change based on player count, so it's probably a practical concern, but the aesthetic was very busy. Should mention the comparison to Coimbra, which I think is uh w- which is what I thought and Coimbra was a game that I think just had a really interesting dice drafting that then that that goes into interesting worker placement decisions. They're, they're not exactly the same game, but I found myself wishing I was playing Coimbra again. Yeah. Um, so and I, I, I don't think know. the interaction Maybe is a lot lo- tighter with Coimbra. Like there's a, it's a lot more direct, and I think there's just a couple fewer subsystems going on that are more interesting than with Crystal Palace. What else did we play? Tokyo Highway. I want to talk about that one because that's a game that's been around a while. It has amazing table presence. It looks so cool. They always have the big giant version out at the PAXs. And finally we're like, well, let's actually play this thing. And my impression was I enjoyed playing it and I don't really care to play it again. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it felt like the most gamer, <laughs> like it felt like a serious gamer dexterity game, but ended up being something that I didn't really want. Would you have enjoyed it more if you had played the giant version? Yes. I think yes, undoubtedly I would it would have been more fun <laughs> with the giant version. Cause I think the major problem I have is that the pieces are too light and just like too it's weird to say this on a stacking game where part of the tension is knocking things over, but in a game where if you do knock things over, you repair them, they were way too light and too easy to knock over and too difficult to repair. Oh yeah. We just, we gave up and like a big section of our highway, we just left. Yeah. It was just a ruin. So I would have preferred slightly heavier yeah, components the- with a bit more friction. The other thing, and I think this is just a tension in a a dexterity game where like, so the limit on how well you do, one of the limits is your skill and dexterity. But in Tokyo Highway, that's fighting against the scoring system where you can very clearly see the best play. And so maybe you force yourself into a situation where you're doing this ridiculous thing that you're probably not skilled enough to do, but you're going to do it anyway, because the only way that you're going to win is if you pull off this particular move. You know what I mean? Right. And it's not necessarily exciting to do so. I I came up with an idea while playing the game with regard to dexterity games. Um, because I was thinking, why do I enjoy, to- or why do I not really enjoy Tokyo Highway, but why do I enjoy Catch the Moon, which is a dexterity game I've written about recently uh, that we've had a lot of fun with. And my theory is that a dexterity game is, the ideal state for a dexterity game is that you are successful more often than you anticipate. And in Tokyo Highway, I was successful less often than I anticipated. So you want the game to appear incredibly difficult, but you want more successes than that. Tokyo Highway appeared yeah. moderately difficult and was just frustrating. Whereas Catch the Moon appears sometimes you're, Catch you're the like, moon is can I even, like, is this even within the bounds of physics? And there's just enough friction on those ladders that you can sometimes do stuff that, that surprises you, uh, which I think is... is joyful and delightful i also think that's true for jenga which it it really honestly the only problem with jenga is that it's just such a pain to set up otherwise i think it's a really nice dexterity game and i think in my plays of jenga that i can remember i've been more successful than i thought i would be and again there's just more there's just enough friction there to hold the thing together beyond what you think it would hold whereas in Tokyo Highway, again, everything was so light and slippery that it just kind of wouldn't hold together. Any other games you guys wanted to talk about? 
I got to play Irish Gage for the first time. That was fun. Oh, uh, hadn't, nice. Hadn't played that before. That was fun. I played with Matt and uh, Kimberly, so it was a good time. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Irish Gage is fun. Um, second time playing was just as good as the first, so. I just enjoyed that there was this Twitter thread going around about Tom Russell's very, very odd games. And now the Irish Gage is a uh, is is a pretty good success. <laughs> there was a joke going around that he should just put on a, in the announcements for all of his really really obscure crazy games from the designer of Irish Gage, <laughs> and, and and completely mislead people. He did this guilty land, wasn't that the, the yeah one or the or his new release Westphalia, which is a <laughs> six player only negotiation game about the Treaty of Westphalia. From the creator of Irish Gage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were a couple other games that I played that were all right. Through the Desert was weird. Probably shouldn't play it with five players. Flam Rouge was really underwhelming to me. I think I like Flam Rouge better than, than you did. I, I think the deck management, and you have two decks, a sprinter and kind of a pace setter, was pretty interesting. The other thing that Flamme Rouge has is this drafting, not in terms of cards, but in terms of aerodynamics, aerodynamics yeah. which I think is quite clever. In our game, I think we ended up doing like the, we kind of did the most boring thing possible in that we moved as one clump the entire game. But I think it has potential to be, you know, on par with Downforce. I don't know. I'd give it another shot. I also got to play a game called Stay Cool, which I don't know if it's released. I think it's released in French, maybe, but not in English quite yet, which is a party game where you are basically being bombarded with questions from two different people and then have to verbalize one of the answers and then spell out the other answer with dice that have letters on them. And it was hilarious, and I really want a copy. It, it was so funny and exactly my kind of game. A party game about being stressed. <laughs> Didn't everyone else, after the rules explanation there, basically just want to not play? <laughs> yes. And I was enthusiastic, and I got to play twice. It was, it was very fun. It was very, very fun. And I got to play on a harder difficulty level where I also, the, the player answering the questions also has to manage the timer, the, uh, the sand timer. And if you let it run out all the way before flipping it, you you lose. So that was even more fun. So there's a third thing to keep track of. And then apparently the, the most difficult level is that you have to keep track of the stand timer, but you can't see it. So you have to estimate oh, when the good. 30 seconds is up and then tell someone to flip it. <laughs> wow. Which, oh, I'm, I, I really want to play this game more. It was really, really fun. And then finally, we did some Magic the Gathering drafts, which has become kind of a tradition at PAX Unplugged Ooh. for us. I did two of them. Did you just do the two, Matt? Uh, the two plus the bonus one that we did. Oh, yeah, the bonus one at home because we won so many packs. I did their <laughs> their mystery draft. Was it, that, was it called Mystery Booster Draft? Mystery Booster Draft, which the convention version had. There's a card pool of like 1,300 cards from Magic's history like all the way back plus this play test card which is just kind of like a ridiculous card that is half joke half does something that they never actually do in the game yeah and i thought that um, was great fun i had a blast with the mystery draft all kinds of random cards you just kind of winged it by the seat of your pants uh end up making a control yeah. deck which i rarely do but it worked quite well yeah, it it was pretty cool. Um, I mean, I'll be honest. I enjoyed drafting the the Eldraine, the set that I know a lot more because I I don't super enjoy a drafting experience where I don't understand the big picture. In a sense, what makes drafts so great is when you understand the big picture, because um, then you're you have a basis to make valuations. Uh, this mystery booster thing, you had to throw that out the window. So it, it was fun. I, I forget what, what deck I made. I think it was a three-colored deck because I had a, a three-colored mythic. And it did not work out. Yeah, whereas I, I'm, I, I like the big picture strategy stuff that you get with a, with a set that you know well. But I also just like drafting by the seat of my pants and seeing what crazy stuff can happen. Uh, which... 
Yeah. And I, you I also really did very it. well. I also <laughs> yeah. didn't lose a single game, so yeah. that might have colored my impressions of the format. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And little did, uh, survivor bias there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we did the Aldrain draft, which Orion won uh, with his knight's deck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you yeah, drafted I don't, a very I've effective aggro. I've never played Aldrain, aggro... I don't think. Yeah, you, you, you drafted a very effective, effective aggro knight's deck and then passed me all kinds of insane hey, Mark, yeah. green cards. That was hilarious. We were sitting one, two, three, I think me, Mark, Orion. I got to draft the mono blue mill deck that it is like brings joy to children it. far and wide it's the, <laughs> yes the opposite of that <laughs> but it, it brought joy to me and it, it's the kind of thing that only works about like one in four drafts but i was the only one going for these cards i found my lane i executed i lost in the first round a, a really close game, but because I I was so set on 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 this this one monocolored deck, I kept passing the green cards to Orion, and apparently Orion didn't want them, and then they went to Mark. So I, I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, pack two, I got so many insane green cards, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm in green now, because I thought I was gonna yeah, do white yeah. blue flyers. And then uh, third pick, I get the great henge, and I'm like, "What is going on?" And yeah. <laughs> uh, got ended up. In well, and, the, and, the, black. and the guy to my left, the guy to my left was mono red. So, oh yeah, <laughs> all the green so, was like, being filtered to my end of the table, regardless of which direction we were passing, which was um, crazy. And then I opened up like a, a alt art murderous writer. I'm like, well, I'm definitely taking that, and then maybe I'll dip into black and end up in green black. So, so he, here's something interesting. When I play paper magic, when I do a draft in paper, I have no hesitation of passing like a great card that I'm not going to use for my draft. So like when I'm drafting at a table, I'm 100% drafting the best deck I can draft. When I do it on arena, I'm not like that at all. I, I rare draft. Which is you know, bananas because that makes no sense because <sighs> the cards are worth far more on paper. Yeah, in terms of money, you're absolutely correct. I think there's something pure about drafting at a table where I just I love the drafting experience. Oh yeah. Um, and, and with Aldrain, I know the format, so I, I I knew all the possible decks that I could be drafting. So finding your lane, navigating there, and then going for a winning deck, even when it means passing the Great Henge <laughs> down the line, is something that that I can do in paper, and I like that because. When I rare draft on Arena, it kind of feels bad because you know your deck's going to be worse. <laughs> well, then don't do it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but other reasons, I don't know. I don't know why that is. But yeah. No, I, I, I always draft. love drafting. It is, to me, by far the best magic format. I don't know why anyone plays anything else. Draft, play with that, and then uh, sell the cards. And then what a blast to go home. Uh, that night and, and draft well, again. Right, but then because you, you had won a tournament and I had won a tournament and we had enough tickets between the four of us or five of us who were playing that we just got another or booster box or however many, 24 packs or something. Yeah. And uh, went home and drafted again that night. <laughs> yeah, and I got I opened an uh, full art bleed, whatever it's called, Oko, which is worth 55 bucks. So yay me. I still they're in a they're in a box somewhere. I gotta sell those cards. I gotta figure out how so to sell next, all these magic cards. The that next draft next draft is on you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's one set, I think it's cons that everyone seems to love for drafting from back in the day that I think I'll try to get a set of that. Anyways, yeah, Oko's still worth money, even though it's banned, but uh, I guess it's doing work in modern. Doing work in modern. Yeah. That was fun. And then I finally built a deck that lost at home. But it lost very slowly. <laughs> I made a super I degenerate you. You deck. You were talking up your deck so much, and then and all these I just, sweet mono blue cards. It was it was not even slow. I just wrecked you in two games, Mark. Yes, but they were long <laughs> games. <laughs> were they? I finally drafted a good deck in the the one we did at home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I I drafted a terrible deck. I just I tried to go like red green. Yeah. aggro and then or food or something and just like not I, I didn't get anything 
And I don't know if that's just like a bad combo in that set, or Red if I just green's tough. Picked, if I, I don't know, maybe I just picked bad cards. Yeah. One thing I love about Magic Draft, and um, this happened in the, in this bonus draft we did, is sometimes there's like a rare card that is like not really good, but there's this one case where it really does work. So I got past the Fabro Elder, which is a green white card and it's not that good especially in dr- draft basically it, it ramps you it, it it taps for multiple mana so if you're trying to cast huge things early it's that's the one case that it's good so i i just i just love that i was able to construct a, gr- a deck that took advantage of of that card that normally isn't great those are the experiences I love in, in, in drafting Magic cards. It's a fine tradition we have at PAX's, and I hope we continue it. On Sunday, we took our annual pilgrimage to the great Mexican restaurant of Philadelphia, South Philly Barbacoa. Matt, do you want... You, it was your first time there. Do you want to describe it for us as, a, oh, sh- as your first experience? Sure, yeah. I mean, you, you, you go in, you see the counter with, like... Eight people working behind it, just like chopping up meat, pressing tortillas right there in front of you. Apparently, they offer you uh, tastes, you know, if you're waiting in line. But we headed back to the back, got a big, big table, and then they just brought out this massive plate of pork. Or no, it was lamb. 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 Oh, my goodness. Lamb and then some like spicy pork on the a little bit on the side. And then the most impressive thing is this the soup. Now, what was that called? Consomme. The consomme might have been the tastiest soup I've ever had. Uh, so, what it, it's like made with the drippings of the slow cooked meat. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, oh my goodness! So much flavor, like an overwhelming amount of flavor. And then, and then we made tacos with with the meat, and it was that was exceptional too. But like this consomme was was mind blowing. Yes, so, so Matt knows that's that my I'm first not, experience. I don't go around talking up this place from just for the sake of it. It's that good. It's so it's good. That good. So find it's, this place next time you go to Philadelphia. Yeah, undoubtedly one of the best restaurants I've ever been to in my life. It's. I'm not. I'm not like a, a foodie, um, so I didn't know what a consomme is, but. And I imagine it would be hard to make at home because you're you're trying you have to collect the drippings of a slow roast. But, uh, yeah, you could you yeah. make a consomme. You won't make that one. Yeah, yeah, that one's exemplary. It's it's absolutely incredible. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And it's only like a mile from the convention center, maybe a mile and a half. So you could walk it. You could if, walk it if you wanted to. Yeah, um, if it wasn't so cool. All right, my time is wrapping up. I have things to do here with the in-laws here on vacation. Any final highlights from PAX for you guys? I mean, there was Snake. That was that was a fun game. Wait, what? Uh, yeah, we... go, going back to the physical organization. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we thought we were clever by, like, cutting around the convention center to go in the other side. And then we that just meant that we had to follow the line backwards nearly entirely around the convention center to where we had started <laughs> to get in line. And then we were literally snaking back and forth, but the line is moved quickly. So at least that was nice. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I think the apartment we rented with uh, us and all of our friends this year was fantastic. Thanks to Steph for organizing that. It was huge. There was like an entire basement. We didn't even use. We could have fit definitely more people in there. All the people we went with were fantastic. You guys, Ben, Amber got went for one day. Lindsay was there for a day. Steph, Brad, other Ben, everyone was awesome. It's good. To <laughs> yeah, see. that was a great experience, it, and it was nice to stay close to the the con this year. We did, we we walked every morning. Yeah, getting a place that was within walking distance was was a plus. Yeah, that was it's definitely something we have to maintain. And then for me, this was notable convention in that it was the first time I actually felt like a member of the media. Like I've had a media badge before, but this is the first time, and this is going to sound horribly pretentious or obnoxious. Uh, it was the first time people were like, Oh yeah, I've heard of the thoughtful gamer. Like when I went to a publisher and that felt (laughs) really nice. 
and I feel super awkward saying that, but I'm bad at like, I'm bad at marketing myself and getting the name out there. So the fact that it did get out there and people had heard of it was, was cool. And, uh, I felt like I knew more about what I was doing. So that was a highlight for me. Yeah, that was really cool. I, I followed you around in your media stuff just a little bit, and, and it was pretty cool to see people know the thoughtful game. Oh, speaking of which, I forgot to mention uh, Weave. That was a highlight. Was talking with oh, the guy from yeah. Weave, the RPG system. I can't. There was stuff I had to go contributed to the feeling like a real member of the media. I had to go off the record for. But Weave, the RPG system with the tarot cards, has some crazy stuff going on that they're going to be releasing over 2020 and I'm going to write about it soon. It'll be one of these updates that I'm doing going in more into depth about my PAX uh, experience. Uh, I think I'm going to dedicate one entire day just to weave because it was really, really cool. And I am super excited to see where they're going. Yeah. And I know you saw a bit of that. So that might be the highlight looking back, like just getting excited about that with the guy who created it was a yeah, big we'll, we'll have to talk about, about that more in the future but um i i have a I, feeling we will definitely be talking about it more in the future yeah i i haven't been as excited for an rpg type thing as i am for that in a long time yeah anyways that's our podcast for pax unplugged 2019 again fantastic convention i think it's by far my favorite convention that i've been to uh, although I haven't been to that many of them, but this one is I always look forward to. I, I consider it my main convention for the Thoughtful Gamer each year uh, just because it's so well done and we get to hang out with friends we don't see a lot and the location's great and it's just a fantastic con. So if you have the opportunity to go, I highly recommend it. But anyways, thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, don't forget to go to thoughtfulgamer.com. Again, I will be doing five back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back articles where I go in-depth on some of these games we talked about and many games that we didn't get around to talking about. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or, or wherever you get podcasts. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you would like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Sound right.